Sorry, folks, we're uh, we're geeking out already over here. <laughs> um, but uh, welcome. I see that we have like a bunch of uh, early birds already. Uh, welcome to another uh, episode of the uh, West Coast Jazz Hour. Um, this is what fifty three. Yeah, episode fifty three, um, the last one of twenty twenty two, and uh, we're very excited to do a tribute to one of the founding fathers actually of uh, West Coast Jazz uh, as we know it today, um, Mr. Shorty Rogers. And uh, we're not doing that alone. We have a very special guest uh, with us today who's actually uh, the son of uh, Shorty Rogers. Mr. Marshall Rogers is with his, with us today. Welcome, Thank Marshall. You. Thank you, Marshall. it's an honor. And um, uh, let me give uh, a short uh, introduction to uh, who this man was. Um, Shorty was born as, and I didn't know this actually, but he was born as Milton Rajonsky. That's correct. <laughs> Milton Shorty, uh, Milton Shorty Rogers is arguably one of the greatest musicians in West Coast history. Born in Great Barrington, Massachusetts on April 14th, 1924 and died on November 7th, 1994 in Van Nuys, California. His first gigs were with Will Bradley and Red Norvo. Uh, he went on to play with Woody Herman, where he was in the band together with Terry Gibbs. We just spoke about that. He recorded the famous version of Early Autumn with that band in 1950. And in 1951, he started to work uh, for Stan Kenton. And if you don't know who uh, Shorty was, he was a trumpet and flugelhorn player slash composer, arranger and uh, producer. And uh, his, you know, his uh, discography is just incredible and immense and wrote for uh, so many great people and made also his own uh, really fantastic um, albums with the greatest uh, jazz musicians coming from the the west coast um, so we're gonna little, uh, we're gonna do a little bit of a, uh, a small overview of some recordings uh, that um, uh, that we have some of our favorites uh, favorites some of uh, Marshall uh, Marshall's favorites he brought a bunch of CDs also with him um, but um, maybe to start off with the question um, that your dad went into the Stan Kenton band and I guess that was the reason why he moved to uh, California yeah yeah my my folks there was a there was a portion of that time with the Kenton band where the wives were allowed on the bus and as they toured the country and uh, with Stan being from Southern California that was always a mandatory loop in mm -hmm. the bus and my folks just loved it out here and at some point I think they kind of put two and two together saying they didn't like cold weather they liked the warm weather of Southern California there were the studios which was uh, an obvious source of work mm -hmm. um, and they got off the bus mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. they were living uh, in a, a rented home in Hermosa Beach mm -hmm. not far from the lighthouse right but the the lighthouse thing didn't gel until I think a little later they ultimately left the beach communities and moved to the San Fernando Valley to Burbank to be close to the studios and after a few years and a growing family moved from Burbank to Van Nuys where they lived for the whole time I was a kid mm. um, but uh, uh, mm -hmm. it's uh, that's your father on your phone yeah, yeah. <laughs> a shorty, shorty ringtone yeah. 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 yeah I'm glad you recognize yeah, 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 yeah. yeah well that's here with us yeah yeah that, 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 yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that, that trumpet sound is unmistakable wow. yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's fun. <laughs> and what was it? Do you do you happen to know if it was apparent for your father to uh, become also a, a composer and a, an arranger? Because for for all I know, he wrote stuff for the Kenton band as well. That's correct. So was the was that already something that he had in mind? Of that's my understanding. Mm. That that uh, part of the impetus, the initiative to come out here was to branch out beyond performing. Mm. And they, you know, they had to do their time in L.A. 
there was a requirement with the musicians union that you I guess have some sort of residency requirement mm -hmm. um, so they were out here for a while um, before he became a member of the musicians union um, and when they moved from Burbank to Van Nuys the property that they bought was pretty sizable and at one end of the lot was the home at the other end down a little hill was a converted two-car garage that my dad used as a studio mm. he had his privacy there there were no close neighbors back there and that was all motivated by the idea of being more front and center composer arranger mm. um, mm. well he, he sure did really well for himself because mm -hmm. he was he made himself also in a, into a public figure working in movies. I mean, man with a golden arm, he's in that movie. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah, he told me once that that gig, the acting part of it, was very traumatizing. Uh, really? That they had to do a number of takes, and uh. at the end of the day, he was just happy to come home and have a drink. <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. I could see it being a traumatizing yeah. scene. But that yeah. crossover between between jazz and film was fascinating if you study it. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. one, of, one of his big proponents was Marlon Brando, oh. the movie The Wild One, um, which my, I think my dad gets a performance credit on, but not a writing credit. Mm. Leth Stevens. Oh, oh yeah. And the story behind that is kind of interesting that, um, and, and I hope I'm not exaggerating it too much, but apparently when it came time for Marlon to sign the contract, it was a trip to the studios. And uh, before he signed, he said, uh, I have a guy to do the music and that's Shorty Rogers. Oh, wow. Marlon had been going to the lighthouse and seeing my, my dad's group perform down there. <laughs> And the studio said, Shorty who? Mm -hmm. we, we don't know this guy. Oh. So um, hmm. Marlon said, <clears throat> in some circumspect way, basically, no Shorty, no Marlon. Wow. wow. So um, huh. the studio grabbed a couple of Pinkerton security guards and said, on Sunday, we need you to go down to the lighthouse and listen to this group and make sure that these guys are presentable, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> that they could do the music and all that. So they, they, the, the story I heard is that they actually dressed the Pinkerton guards up as uh, like beatniks, <laughs> gave them berets, told them not to shave, and <laughs> <Undercover>. and <clears throat> yeah. And, and they went down there and all the regulars at the lighthouse like were pointing saying, what is with those guys? Yeah. <laughs> They're so obviously out of, out of central casting. Yeah. Uh, but the guards came back on Monday and said, everything's on the up and up. And so my dad got the gig wow. and everything went very well. A short, shorty, I think there were a few times where in which Marlon got to sit in with the band. Oh playing uh, conga drum, oh, bongos, yeah. mm -hmm. budding <laughs> percussionists. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, that's yeah, awesome. Advocate Marlon Brando. Yeah. That's wonderful. Yeah. What a great story. Yeah, yeah. And how many people can say that? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, um, uh, we're going to show some uh, recordings in a chronological order. Uh, so I have to take out. We're going to first... Um, listen to a tune that's called uh, Porterhouse and it's uh, an original composition by Andre Previn because uh, uh, Shorty Rogers and Andre Previn made a, a record together called Collaboration with, um, this is, it's escaping my mind if it's either a sextet or a, oh, yeah. a septet. Uh, that album's right there. Yeah, show. yeah <laughs> that's right. Here we go. <laughs> Kevin got this for my birthday. Yeah. What a good friend. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, but it's and from a great cover, as Marshall pointed out. Yeah, Jim, Jim Flora. Wonderful illustrations. Gosh. Yeah. yeah. It's almost like half the, the the love of the music. I mean, I'm a big vinyl guy. It's it's a great it's, it's great cover art. Right? Absolutely great cover oh, art. Mm. And yeah. it just fits the the vibe of the record so well. 
Okay, Porterhouse. Porterhouse okay. by Shorty Rogers with Andre Previn. Yes. Early 1950s. On trombone, yes. Bud Shank, Bob Cooper, Jimmy Jufri. Uh, on this track, it's Jack Marshall on guitar, Jack Marshall. and Joe Mondragon on bass, Oof. and Shelly Mann on drums. What a band! What a band! 1954. 54. It's one of the one of the first. It's not the first recording of a shorty that he uh, that he brought out, uh, but it's one of maybe the second or the third recording that he. Uh, brought out under his own name. Okay. Um, and you just mentioned that uh, uh, Andre uh, Previn and uh, your father had a nice relationship because uh, your father was recommended to the academy by Andre. Yeah, that's right. So, uh, do you know something about that? About that relationship that those two yeah, had? Uh, not, not a lot. I mean, I know that uh, my dad and mom would go to dinner with uh, Andre and Mia Farrow, mm -hmm. um, and it was probably that friendship that uh, prompted my mom to name my younger sister Mia. Uh, <laughs> but um, I don't know much more about it than that. Okay, yeah. okay. And was there any uh, any contact with uh, Mia like later? Or do you keep in touch with people that you got to know through your mom and dad or you know musicians that a few mm -hmm. a few you know like um the guy i was we were talking before we started the uh program about uh, musicians that my dad um had some teaching experience with yeah. fred selden mm -hmm. was yeah. was a star pupil recently passed away um i always kept in touch with fred um and a few others, but uh, yeah. you know the, the individuals that are part of the uh, Los Angeles Jazz Institute. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I, yeah. I recently spoke with Terry Gibson over the phone, and 
I, I mentioned a couple of things about you and you know uh, and your father and he goes oh Marshall I haven't seen Marshall in forever yeah <laughs> yeah the last time I saw Terry uh, he was playing a gig with my dad up in Santa Barbara and the memorable line out of Terry that day it was it was a <clears throat> like an oceanfront venue and it was windy as hell mm. that day <clears throat> and Terry got up to the microphone <clears throat> You know, sheet music is blowing around. Everybody's got their clothes pins yeah, yeah, for the yeah. sheet music. And Terry got up to the microphone and said, yeah, hope you'll excuse us. We, we've never played a hurricane before. <laughs> <laughs> oh, sounds, like, sounds like Terry. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Wow. Yeah. And, the, and also that uh, I actually, he, Terry, has the original picture and he gave me a copy of it. And it's a um, photograph of the Woody Herman band with your dad in it recording the uh, early autumn version like the oh, famous wow. early autumn oh version no kidding with, I'd uh, love to see that the, 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 I'll, I'll, I'll have to send it to you it's, yeah. it's everybody in there with Stan Getz Zoot Sims and Sir, Serge Chaloff, Chaloff yeah. in the in wow. the saxophone section and then Chubby Jackson Lou Levy mm -hmm. uh, Don Lamont Terry Oof. is the uh, are, is the rhythm section, and then your dad is like fourth or fifth trumpet mm -hmm. in in there. Mm -hmm. So the, uh, he has the the original like in a wow. in a frame like in his office. <laughs> yeah, I've been meaning to call him up and invite myself over to his place to oh, see you, his uh, his wall. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah. yeah. great wall. Oh yeah, that that, that, that wall is is definitely insane. <laughs> 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 that that's that's kind of like you know. A, a, a dream to see like holy moly this yeah. guy has done literally everything that's right um let's see move on to another track yeah i'm gonna see what it is the next uh, the next thing uh, that is uh chronological in chronological order yeah. we're skipping uh over to uh to a, a different album because we're not doing it in an actual chronological order but um roughly roughly yeah. yes there you thank go. you <laughs> good enough uh, the next, uh, I, I, th this was one actually that is uh, a very fun one to show because uh, that was sort of like uh, a septet. This is an actual quintet, so uh, a nice small group uh, recording of uh, Wherever the Five Winds Blow. And this is with uh, Larry Bunker on drums. And the track is, uh, marooned, is marooned in a mansoon. Monsoon? Monsoon, monsoon yeah. Monsoon, yeah. Your father also had a talent of coming up with uh, titles. original titles. Yeah, <laughs> I, and I could tell stories about that. Really? You know, some of them are named for, well, my older sister Michelle, Michelle's lullaby. Uh huh. Uh, yeah. Others for family pets. Uh huh. You know, it just goes on. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Okay. This is um, is this long? Oh no, it's almost four. five. That's okay. Yeah. Okay. So where are we year wise now? Still in we the fifties. We are still in the fifties. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see where this is. Uh, Shorty Rogers, wherever, wherever the five winds blow. This is from nineteen fifty seven. So this is okay. three year yeah. three years after collaboration.
Very tight. Tight. Yeah. Great arrangements. Everything's in its place. There's still a lot of freedom, but I just love God. What a, what a joy to get to listen to this music with you. Thank thanks for doing this. With oh, I'm I'm enjoying this it immensely. Fun. Thank you guys. <laughs> it's, a, it's really an honor. Wow. And one of our past guests, um, Pinky, the great vocalist Pinky Winters, you had a connection with Pinky. Yeah, <laughs> I, we were talking a little earlier, yeah. and I mentioned that uh, you know like. Growing up with my folks, my dad working with uh, musicians in the community, I would often hear names of individuals, one of which was Pinky Winters, but I didn't realize, yeah, my folks had friends in the music business, they had friends outside the music business, I had no clue when they'd mention a name how that person fit in. I always knew that Pinky Winters had babysitted for me and my brother and sister mm. and it was only much later that somebody said to me uh you know uh, she's a fabulous vocalist i'm saying no no she's a babysitter what are you talking about <laughs> so yeah. poor pinky yeah, putting right. up with us yeah 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 oh, that's cool yeah that's awesome yeah do you know anything about mm -hmm. um because uh, you know, the, your phone just w rang and it was your father's sound and then we're listening to his trumpet sound right now. Do you know anything about where he got his uh, inspiration from regarding his trumpet playing, like influences? Or even teachers. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, do, I know he went to the High School of Music and Art af after the family moved from Western Massachusetts to New York City. Uh, he was enrolled in the High School of Music and Art. He had started playing with a uh, oh, it's it's a like a veterans band mm -hmm. in the, uh -huh. in Great Barrington, Massachusetts, um, and stuck with it. I mean, the, the it go the story goes way back to my grandfather uh, was a tailor, 
and got the assignment to make a couple of suits for a guy. When the suits were ready, the guy showed up with no cash but a trumpet. Mm. I think it was a bugle, actually. Mm. And they did a swap, and that was how my dad got uh, uh, interested in playing the bugle and subsequently the trumpet and subsequent to that, the flugelhorn. Mm. Um, but early influences... Uh, I remember talking with my dad a lot about the Count Basie Orchestra. Mm. Um, so um, that would be, help me here. Thad Jones. Thad Jones. Yeah. Uh, Snooky. Snooky. Snooky, yeah. yeah. Um, there's another, yeah. uh, it'll come to me. Yeah. But um, Count Basie, big influence. Um, you know, my... my uh, Dad's sister was married to Red Norvo, oh. Oh. so there was there was some uh, family vibes going on in that direction. <laughs> Pun intended. Yes, exactly. <laughs> uh, wow, that's and so cool. and they were able to uh, oh. uh, hire one another for this gig and that gig. Oh. So uh, Red was quite a character. I really enjoyed having him as an uncle. Mm. Uh, I bet. Yeah. I'm a big yeah. Red Norvo fan. Yeah, a lot same of here. His records. Yeah, we enjoy his stuff a lot. Yeah. Uncle Red. Let yeah. Go. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> That's, That's great. cool. That's yeah. awesome. Yeah. Um, wow. So, were you, Marshall, you were possibly old enough to be around some of the sessions that he was on? Did you ever go to recording sessions with Yeah. As yeah. A young man? Yeah, it was yeah. it was largely an exercise of uh, uh, sit over there and yeah. don't say anything. <laughs> yeah. uh, um, but I got to know some of the musicians, mm -hmm. and and some of them, you know, there were very close friendships that went beyond the music association. Harry Betts, mm -hmm. the trombonist, yeah, yeah absolutely, <clears throat> was known in the family as Uncle Harry. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, my uh, uncle Red. Mm -hmm. um, but there were a few others, uh, um, some of which I didn't discover until later. Um, Eddie Burt, yeah, long-term long best friend of my father's. The trombone player. And, yeah, yeah, fabulous guy. Mm. Um, but uh, they're not all still around. Very yeah. unfortunate. Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yeah. Wow. Just to be on the fly, a fly on the wall, even as a kid, or you know, whatever. I yeah. I have dreams of. The, the yester years of Hollywood and the, those glory days of just being around and just the feeling of this music just being so new. Yeah, a lot then. of that recording was happening in the 50s, obviously. And yeah. at some point when my dad uh, got more serious about writing and composing, he was doing work outside the field of jazz, mm -hmm. um, scoring movies, uh, uh, not all of which was, was sort of uh, jazz right. oriented. He did a bunch of work for the Monkees mm -hmm. and oh. working with the Wrecking Crew. Mm -hmm. um, and I would get invited to some of those sessions because my interest back when I was in high school was more oriented to rock and roll. Sure. Um, Wasn't he also part with the Fifth Dimension? I don't know about that. That's a good question, Kevin. Oh, yeah. I'll have to do a little digging on it. Yeah, I've seen. I I, I think I might have seen some stuff on Discogs, like a, mm. a writing credit uh, on like uh -huh. some kind of recording of the Fifth Dimension. Yeah, that I've seen, and that's mm. that's like actual Wrecking Crew stuff because all of those people were were there. Yeah. Um, the, uh, the, the, there's also a discussion. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if you're f uh, familiar with that, but there's a discussion about uh, using the term "wrecking crew" because everybody showed up, you know, in suits and ties, and yeah. you know, everybody was was fine. And apparently, it was uh, uh, the term came up uh, because of uh, Hal Blaine, the drummer, but nobody else really dug the 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 term wrecking crew and, yeah uh, for example carol carol Kay, the, the great bass player yeah she goes like no 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 don't call it the wrecking crew we were studio musicians <laughs> yeah yeah the, i hope you've seen the uh oh, fabulous you. documentary oh, yeah. that uh denny Incredible. tedesco did yeah uh uh, uh, uh the guitarist right son uh, uh, yeah tommy tedesco tommy tedesco yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's 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 an absolutely great documentary, and and my dad gets a mention in there in his association with uh, Herb Alpert. Oh, apparently there was a session 
that was kind of uh, off the books for Herb, recording some stuff that Herb had composed with some of my dad's musicians and the Wrecking Crew. And subsequently decisions were made to put it out on vinyl and they had to go back and register all of the uh, musicians who were at the session mm, to make it make it legit mm, wow that's awesome yeah, that's yeah. pretty cool uh i was uh considered for t herb's touring band recently I no kidding auditioned and everything it didn't work out didn't do it but well just to be considered very nice to be considered and yeah. get to meet him yeah, in his early nineties, still touring. Yeah, Incredible. a true gentleman. Apparent, yeah, a wonderful guy, yeah. and apparently lived a block this way in the fifties and sixties. Yeah, just over here, like at Vista. You know, yeah, I think he went to Melrose High. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. 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 So he has deep LA roots, and wow, that's I didn't know the story with with your dad. He uh, when yeah. Stan Getz passed away, mm -hmm. um, the story could go on forever, but the short version is he <laughs> and Herb were very close and after the cremation um, Herb called my dad my dad was a boater had a power boat and uh, agreed to take Herb's uh, uh, Stan's ashes out off Malibu and spread them at sea wow. and uh, it was quite an event my dad called me oh, said hey wow. I need a crewman to help me manage yeah. this and wow about a dozen people showed up and very special wow yeah. that's awesome part of my addition with Herb was he graciously allowed me to have lunch with him and his wife and he told Lonnie me, Lonnie he told me about his close connection with Stan yeah and how close they were mm. you know how just yeah pretty pretty special relationship they had there seems like yeah yeah Love those awesome. intersections yeah <laughs> and I, I mean your your father knew Stan gets all also for years Oh many, yeah, many years. yeah. They were they were kids together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. To, I mean, to think about that, you know, you don't really <laughs> consciously. I I at least don't really consciously yeah. think about that. <laughs> well, this was, you know, my dad was so well connected that, like, yeah. like I was saying earlier, I would go to gigs with him, uh, go to recording sessions, and afterward, I'd say, "Hey, Dad, who was that?" And he'd say, "You know." Uh, um, that was that was James Moody. I'd never heard of James Moody at the time. Right. And then next thing I know, I've got a a Dizzy Gillespie disc, and Dizzy is introducing mm -hmm. James Moody as the world's greatest saxophonist. Mm -hmm. It's like from from <laughs> Dizzy Gillespie's <laughs> lips. Right. 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 Wow. What what is what is kind of the is there a moment in time where you met somebody? either you didn't know before who he or she was or you did know who he or she was and that you were just you know your father worked with this person and you, you were just enamored with either meeting this person or then figuring out who it was like the, the well, most I, famous I, person i knew about jerry mulligan before i met him oh, okay. at a performance at the hollywood bowl my yeah. dad and i went backstage and and wanted to say hello and he introduced me to jerry i was in awe of the uh, recordings he did with Chet Baker, mm. uh, the pianoless quartet mm -hmm. stuff, uh, and to meet him was was really special. But yeah, the list goes on. Yeah, wish I'd done it more. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it sounds like you've done a good amount. <laughs> Fair amount. Yeah. yeah. Should we listen to some more music? Yeah. yeah. Uh, do what do we got next? Chronologically further on, we're going into some large ensemble stuff. Very good. Cool. And uh, that's that, that's where my my own personal love with the stuff that your uh, father has done is actually the the biggest for me because he worked with a he worked with Mel Lewis. Yes. Who is my you know if that's if you don't know that's my <laughs> most favorite drummer. No one could kick off a band better than Mel. Yes. Yes, well I wholeheartedly ag agree yeah, with yeah. that. Uh, this record is not just yet with Mel, but it's uh, with uh, Stan Levy because um, that's the that's the cool part about all of these records that your dad made, and maybe you can shed some ins insight on that too. But they're more or less concept albums. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, because there's uh, the I mean the collaboration with Andre Previn, you know, that speaks for itself. Yeah. Um, wherever the five winds blow i think all of the titles have to do something with yeah, the weather, weather. 
Mm -hmm. uh, the the monsoon, and then the the one of the tracks is called Hurricane Carol, for right. example. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah, and this is uh, Shorty Rogers plays Richard Rogers of the uh, the the famous uh, songwriter and yeah. composer, and uh, he started to get into uh, the large ensemble stuff. And I think the track of this is uh, what is it? That I think it's that no, that's uh, Melter yeah, May. Yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, that's the the white shoe mate. Yeah, that's this one. Yeah. Okay. I could write a book. I could write a book. That's a yep. writer's <laughs> tune. Okay.
Maynard. Wow. Yeah. That's Maynard, Maynard right there. Signature. <laughs> wow. Did did you ever get to see any of the the big band stuff that you no. did? No, you know the 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 story on that is that you know I was born in 1951, and most of my dad's work was in the 50s, early 60s, until mm. the British invasion, and and that's about the time that he started. He got off the stage and was doing more and more uh, composing, arranging movies scoring movies, doing TV shows. Some of the TV shows were, in my opinion, kind of lame. Mm. The Love Boat, you know. Oh, he did that? Yeah, yeah. Wow. yeah. Starsky and Hutch. Okay. Oh, uh, that's cool. Quint for the 70s yeah. And 80s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. quintessential 70s yeah. stuff. Starsky that that to me was not cool when right. my friends would say, hey, I saw your dad's name on the credit <laughs> for The Love Boat. I'd like <laughs> shirk away. <laughs> but um, <laughs> um, so, there was about a, I don't know, a 10 year period, mostly the seventies in which my dad was not performing. Mm. And then he got together with Bud Shank mm, and, yep. and a lot of, a lot of uh, fan encouragement and started performing again, touring. And that's when I really started, uh, uh, I was in a position where I could go and see his shows and that sort of thing. It was a real treat. Yeah, yeah. I think I've seen something on YouTube of uh, like a larger group with Shelley and Monty Budwick, Bud Shank, uh, your father. Was this a Japan tour? It might be. Yeah, yeah. It might be, mm. excuse me, late 70s, maybe even like early, early 80s. Early 80s, yeah, 83, yeah. somewhere in there. Yeah. Huh. Just, yeah. Your, just your dad and then four saxophone players uh -huh. but it's Bud Shank, Bob Cooper, Bill, Bill Perkins, Perkins. Ooh, and maybe Perk. Nimitz Jack could have Nimitz. been yeah the admiral they called him yeah the admiral yeah yeah yeah, yeah. The, you can find it somewhere on oh. on, on YouTube I have to look for that is this that the, the third one there yes exactly that's it yeah Very and cool. the west coast giants yeah. yeah maybe we should watch a little bit of that yeah what do you think yeah put it on yeah that would be great yeah i got a chance to play with some of these like Bill Perkins and Nimitz before they passed away. Yeah, in yeah. Mike Barone band. Barone's band. Yeah, Mike uh huh. Barone, yeah, Bill Perkins was a character. Oh, he was great. And those guys getting together. Yeah. At that time in their Dial. lives, they just had a blast. Yeah. Oh, I bet. My dad would tell stories about you know like practical jokes that Shelley would do. Uh huh. Uh huh. <laughs> uh -huh. Right. They're bored stiff sitting on an airplane going to Tokyo. And <laughs> <laughs> Shelley's, Shelley's cracking jokes. And yeah. Yeah, let's watch a little bit of that one. Yeah, that would be great. I haven't seen it. Yep. Oh, oh, this is a composition of your father. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, they used to play this, I think, at the beginning and end of each performance. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, signature right. tune. Comments that were very, very complimentary. 
got odd uh, effects appearing to be stork like mm-hmm. on the stage because it's <laughs> tall and skinny. Yeah. You know? yeah. My dad goes back to the Burbank days. We lived with my folks when they first bought that house. And it turned out what I was told the house next door. So that's the A viewer who was close to They also, Jimmy and my dad studied with the Less than a lot of that. <laughs> nice. yeah. That look on his face. <laughs> yeah. Wow, that was great. So early, early eighties. We yeah. Thinking. Yeah, I think Popo was actually on the very first recording that your dad released. Um, was that cool and crazy? Um. Yes, that m- might be the, Is that the one. The the title of the of the of the album. Now I also actually want to know. Yeah, <laughs> while you're looking. Yeah. Larry Israel is here. Hey, Larry. Thanks for watching. Uh, he wants to know what was Shorty's fascination with Martians. Ah. Uh-huh. Oh, that's a that's a great story. Oh yeah. So, I don't know that he had a fascination with them so much as as it was just a moment that happened in which. Um, the story, as I heard it, was at The Hague here in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. They were performing and, um, uh, you know, th- there was a lot of graffiti in the men's room. Mm. And one of the pieces of graffiti said, uh, kind of making a uh, socially appropriate parody of other graffiti you might see in other places, this one was Martians go home. Mm, mm. <laughs> and uh, so uh, the band 
uh, was on stage. I don't know. Uh, it, it was a just something that happened in the moment, and somebody they played a tune that I think they were just making up as they went along, mm -hmm. um, and somebody said to my dad, "What what's the name of that tune?" And he said, "Oh, uh, Martians go home," because they'd all been visiting the restroom, of <laughs> course, <laughs> over the course of the evening, and uh, and that led to several albums um the and 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 you know it has that spacey yeah kind of kind of feel to it the one that the one that i don't quite understand is the invisible orchard yeah. album which also has that for lack of a better phrase that space cadet tonality uh -huh. to it yeah uh and yet uh they didn't they didn't follow up and name the album uh, along the same lines uh, as Martians Go Home, Martians Come Back, right. yeah. whatever yeah. the others were. Because Martians Go Home is actually an album that That's you're, right. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. wonder if it also was kind of part of that, exo a little bit touching on that Exotica lounge, that space stuff that uh, like Les Baxter was part of and Russ Garcia. They were all yeah. putting out those space yeah kind of theme yeah i think so 60s, it was it was 50 60s 50 60s yeah. when everybody was fascinated with anything nasa yeah. did uh <laughs> huh. and, and what we now love as mid-century modern totally. architecture <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 i have a lot of those records i'm a fan oh okay. well i love concept records so yeah anything thematic of course like that it's yeah. just like right up my alley i just love when it goes into that yeah invisible yeah. orchard was on your list invisible orchard actually. is on the list yeah and martians martians stay home martians come back <laughs> uh what can i see over here uh fourth dimension in sound your oh, yes. your that father has cover, a, a cover, yeah cover yeah That's such a cool cover yeah the very first recording that your father made was called Modern Sounds. Oh, yeah. Uh, uh -huh. The great cover, the blue one with the, yeah, yeah, yeah. the eyes. Good yeah, memory. I got that. I had it it's, I was released on Capitol. That's the Re first one. Yeah, but oh. it was recorded in 1951, but um, uh, released, I think, in 1955. Oh, later. Yeah. Mm. And then Popo, the album Popo, was from 1951. And then you get Shorty Rogers and his Giants in 1953, and then you get Cool and Crazy also yeah, in yeah. 1953. He he released two two records and one uh, 45 RPM vinyl uh, EP in uh, in 1953 called The Wild One. So 1953 was a busy year. You know the the funny thing about my dad, he was a very humble guy, and it. To this day, it amazes me that he would be in the studio. He would come home after recording however many tunes and he'd pop open a beer and sit down and watch a baseball game or a basketball game. And and he, re he really left a lot of the work behind and then he had family time. Mm. Um, and he would always be happy to reply to questions that me or my brother or my sisters had um, mm. but he didn't come home bragging about this, that, or the other accomplishment, mm. um, if, uh, around the perimeter of the den in the house were shelves with albums displayed. And every once in a while, a new album would show up and it was like, Hey dad, why don't you play that for us? Mm. <laughs> That's awesome. You know, break out the stereo. Yeah. <laughs> That's awesome, though. Well, it sounds also mm -hmm. from the whole legacy that y you know how you're how you're talking about it. Oh, that's cool and crazy right there. Um, the with the whole uh, legacy that you're talking about it with so much love that you're like you have great pride in you know telling these things about your your father. Mm -hmm. And it seems yeah. that there there is a there was a lot of love also involved yeah. there. I my pride regarding my dad's career is extreme. Yeah, and, and yet. I always kind of lived by the notion of uh, that was his career. I've got mine. Sure. And I didn't want to be in the shadow. That was part of my decision to not go into the music business. Mm -hmm. um, and this is a rare opportunity for me to sit and, and really soak it up. Right. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, 
I, I'm always digging for new information on my dad and it's like fitting a puzzle together. I can't tell you how many times I've had the thought of, gee, I wish I could have asked him that question mm. or wonder what his thinking was regarding this topic, but yeah, you know. Mm -hmm. But I mean, that's that's also sure. really, really fun to hear that you're trying to, you know, figure out stuff, you know, along the way, is stuff that you didn't know. Is there anything that comes to mind that you recently f found out uh, that you didn't know, uh, some trivia about your father? Well, the the uh, article that my friend Mark Gilmore right. gave me today that yeah. talked about that interview. Um, uh, uh, there, there, there are always these little bits and pieces. So, yeah, it's fun. And as far as like you said, when he wasn't doing music, hobby wise, he he was a baseball fan, baseball fan, what basketball fan, basketball? avid guy. boater. Mm. Spent a lot of time at Catalina Island. Oh yeah, um, he would. He would, uh, in in acknowledgement of the importance of the family to his life, from an early age, for me, he would take summers off, no matter what the demand was for scoring this or performing uh, at this venue or that venue. Come June, he'd check out of work and wouldn't start up again until September. You know, um, I'm I'm sure. Uh -huh. Uh, in the long run, that wasn't good for his career, but he that was his way of Balance. sort of acknowledging yeah. a sane existence for his family, sure. you know. The um, yeah, so so he was he was actively present in the family life, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, his his road time extended uh departures was over by the time I was aware of what was going on. Yeah, yeah. So I don't, I, you know, like, uh, ours was not a family that was, uh, far flung in different locations. We were all together and, and, uh, he was very good about that. Hmm. Hmm. That's very nice to hear. Yeah. 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 That's uh, thank you for sharing some, some personal yeah. stuff. Yeah. Sure. yeah. And it's probably the nature of music business and studio work back then. You could do that. I mean, you had That's enough right. work through the year that you could, hey, this is my family time and I'm not going to work. I mean, I think now work is just all year round and sure, yeah. people take vacations, yep. but you could afford to do that. Well, that was, that was part of the whole controversy between yeah. East Coast and West Coast jazz that mm -hmm. most of the serious jazz musicians would just dismiss. It was often a question that an interviewer would hit them up with, you know, what do you think about East Coast versus West Coast? Shelley Mann was especially um, uh, would, would be especially incensed at that question because most of the jazz musicians that were West Coast came from New York. Yeah, right? you know, <laughs> and and uh, uh, so it was all kind of silly in that regard. Oh but, yeah, yeah. But the but the uh, East Coast folks who were real East Coast jazz enthusiasts would point to those white guys who live in the San Fernando Valley and drive station wagons and dismiss their jazz as not real jazz. Yeah. Well, guess again. Totally. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And you know, West Coast jazz is a term that was, and we've discussed this a, yeah. a bunch of times on, on our show and most uh, memorable was uh, this exact discussion with John Clayton, because he asked the question, what is West Coast jazz? Because West Coast jazz is Shorty Rogers, but it's also Gerald Wilson or Horace Tapscott or even Ornette. Because Ornette was Dave Brubeck. Dave Brubeck. Brubeck. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So Victor for Feldman, so for, many cats. Yeah. 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 And for him, the term West Coast jazz doesn't exist. It's just music to him. And the term West Coast jazz actually was made by critics. It wasn't right. made by the by the musicians. So you know, I would like to make a guess that the musicians were in agreement with each other maybe you know we know that east coast musicians were a little you know there there was a, a back and forth going like oh you're so progressive but it you know doesn't sound as polished and vice versa you know to have critics uh back and forth between east coast and west coast that that was a thing i think between musicians but the term west coast jazz is definitely a critic thing yeah not from yeah. the musicians um now I would like to show like 
maybe my most favorite track that I know of okay. your your dad. Um, it was your birthday recently, so this is what could it you be? You can play whatever you want. Now. Well, <laughs> <laughs> happy birthday, Kevin. Thank you. Yeah, happy Thank birthday. You. Uh, Thank you. Uh, well, the, it's from the the album that's uh, next on the list, which is "Chances Are It Swings," and um, this, and you can totally can correct me if I'm wrong on this one, but this album to me sounds like it is a complete original album of of your father mm -hmm. like it wasn't a concept album it there wasn't really there maybe was an idea behind it but it's a purely original album with all uh original recordings yes and original compositions um and this is my most favorite record because this has like some of the most creative playing of Mel Lewis that I've ever heard in my life. And every time when I put on this record, it gives me goosebumps every time. <laughs> so um, the so the, the tune is uh huh. Yeah. Well, yeah. Great cover too. <laughs> What's the tune? No such luck is the yeah, tune no called. Such and I also just love how your dad was able to, you know. I th maybe he had a little bit of a hand in like how the 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 recording was also mixed because his arrangements make the band sound huge and majestic and that's what I what I yeah. really love about that. Yeah, I'd have to agree with that. Uh, okay. <laughs> This entire this entire recording, if you get a chance to listen to it, listen to "Chances Are It Swings," which it does <laughs> by by Shorty Rogers, and yeah, the, that's just an incredible album for me. And there are three tracks where Mel Lewis does a bunch of like fills and extended fills, and I transcribed all of those and you know put them on paper and you know. Uh, 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 practiced, uh, yeah, practiced those. Out. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> see, see if I can do some justice to that. Um, but um, yeah, that I mean, that whole sound also, like the, the what you said, like there is a depth to it, but also that sound of the that very warm sound that you never hear anymore. It's just so like so unique to your to your father. Well, it's also the musicians. I mean, he had the cream of the crop. Uh -huh. That's right. You know, just the absolute best musicians and 
they were all playing at a point in their lives where their chops were just fabulous. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. great studios with incredible mic lockers and incredible engineers. And yeah. just hearing the sound of that room where they did it too. Yeah. Gives you a sense of the um, just the quality of like the musicians, all the pieces, uh, you know. Well, is puzzle. that an RCA? That's RCA Victor recording, isn't it? Is it? Yeah. 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 So I'm not sure where that was recorded, but that definitely wasn't recorded capital. In Hollywood. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, well. That narrows it down. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 12th and 20th of December for 1958, conduct, arranged, conducted by Shorty. I wonder we'd have to do some digging to find out what I was exactly. seven years old at the time. Wow. <laughs> wow. That's amazing. Well, maybe United. You know, United's a good guess. Yeah, United is a very good guess. That's in a storied room because it would have said if it was East West. Yeah. What, but what was East West called? Uh, West Western Recorders. Ah, okay. Yeah, but okay. they did a lot of stuff there too. Yeah, United. I mean, those between those that those two in Capital. Yeah, those the big ones. Do you, because most of these big band recordings that your father uh, recorded and published were on RCA. Did he? Do, would you happen to know if he had? free reign to come up with an idea and make a big band record or I don't know okay yeah okay no, that's that's beyond my knowledge. yeah <laughs> yeah 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 no no worries I yeah. figured I asked yeah. um, and well uh, the next one on the list actually yeah. uh, is the one where we uh, talked about a little bit because that's the Wizard of Oz a fabulous album <laughs> you know I can't tell you how many of my friends who are familiar <laughs> with my dad's music come to me and say that is their favorite mm. uh-huh. yeah well I mean the 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 tune list is really cool and we played this one we played Jitterbug on yeah. our last uh, gig we were which was not in the film it was actually cut from the original you know film it was oh. part of the score that Ar- Arlen wrote but oh. there were a number of songs that didn't make the uh, the actual film yeah well, and that's one of them so Kevin, what's your pick off this? <laughs> uh, well, it's something that we didn't play because we played Blues in the Night live uh-huh. and we played Jitterbug live. But I picked that old Black Magic. Oh, I'm so happy to hear that. Uh, <laughs> it's really a great arrangement. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. This this might be. I mean, this might be my most favorite arrangement from the uh, from the album. And I hope at some point to find maybe some sheet some. Uh, Charts or the sheet yeah. music. Yeah, so that we, we, can we need play to it. talk about that. Yeah, <laughs> that old black magic. Yeah, from you know the Wizard of Oz and Wizard other Wars. Harold Arlen songs. That's right. Yes. <laughs> kind of side one is kind of Wizard of Oz. Yes. Right? Yeah. Side two That's is right. The Arlen. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Here we go. <laughs> Thank you. 
smoking. Mm -hmm. So smoking. Well, a, a bunch of people who we already talked about are actually in this band. Harry Betts yeah. plays in plays in it. Frank Rosalino, Bob Anavolson, your old uh, trumpet teacher Ali Mitchell yeah, is in yeah. the section. Yeah, character with uh, <clears throat> Al Persino, Don Fagerquist, oh. Pete Condoli, Buddy Childers, Herb Geller, Bud Shank, Bill Holman, Chuck Gentry, uh, Joe Mondragon on bass, Mel Lewis. He couldn't get anybody good. Wow, <laughs> it, it, it's 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 yeah. literally the cream of the crop. It's the cream of the yeah. crop. Yeah. What a band! Yeah, what yeah. An album. That that album is also yeah terrific. And if you're just uh, just joining us, we're we're having a great time talking with Shorty's son, great Marshall Rogers, and he's just fantastic sharing his stories. Thank and you. Thank on you. and off the bandstand, <laughs> growing up, yeah, you know, fly on the wall, some of the studios, and Kevin's picked some great tracks, brought some of the vinyl. Having a ball. Yeah. This is great. In Shortyville. In Shortyville. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Deep in Shortyville. Deep in Shortyville. We're surrounded by vinyl right now. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> the next one actually that's on the yeah. on the list, and this comes back a little bit to the to the space thing, but uh, maybe you can uh, shed some light on Invisible Orchard. Well, I wish I could. <clears throat> or whatever you know about it. What I know is that, <clears throat> and... I want to say it was recorded in 1963 and not released for about 20 years later. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Um, the story behind that, I wish I knew. Mm -hmm. Why the delay? Um, you know, I, in, in, uh, reviewers can be reviewers and, and, uh, decisions are made regarding, uh, an album here or there the one that i've been paying attention to you know we're in getting into the christmas season now and so um the one i've been paying attention to lately is the uh nutcracker suite yep mm -hmm. um the swing and nutcracker mm -hmm. and the story that i just recently became aware of is that at the same time in 1960 that my dad was working on that album um duke ellington was working on a similar Nutcracker Suite album. The two were released, I think, within a month of one another. Oh, wow. <clears throat> and wow. Huh. you can find reviews of those albums that say my dad's Nutcracker Suite album was far superior. <laughs> you can find reviews that pan that same album. Mm -hmm. um, wow. And it's just based on the subjectivity, you know, how far away from the original Nutcracker Suite should one go. Mm, right. Um, the the reviews say my dad went further out, and <clears throat> those reviewers that like the album say <clears throat> that's why they like it. Mm. You hear traces of Tchaikovsky, um, mm. as opposed to the reviewers who said too far out. Mm -hmm. uh, they want more uh, uh, similarity to the original. Uh, which was the Duke Ellington yeah. uh, album. So um, what's the holdup? Why 20 years until The Invisible Orchard was released and why does it have that title? I don't know. Mm, Gosh, mm -hmm. I wish I did. Mm. But it's a very, it's a, I didn't actually put it on a list, but maybe we can, you know, finagle it in there <clears throat> that we can uh, show a tune of the, uh, uh, of the Nutcracker yeah, because, suite yeah. because I didn't know this piece of trivia that they that the Ellington version and your father's yeah. version were released so close to yeah. each other. Yeah, and yeah. I and I absolutely love Duke's uh, version of it. I absolutely love uh, your father's version also of it. We played a tune on uh, the last uh, big band West Coast big band gig. We played "Pass the Duke" off of uh, the off of the suite, and I think it's just. I mean, they're two completely different voices in in music, two completely different ideas. Because yeah. your father did, I think, two sessions with a full big band, and then a couple of pieces are for saxophone quintet with rhythm section. Yeah. So completely different sounds, completely different atmosphere, in 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 comparison with the the Duke uh, version, which. Might, you you might consider that it's a little bit closer to the Tchaikovsky thing, but I love I love both of those mm -hmm. albums. Well, you know, they always say you can't judge a book by the cover, but when you have two albums come out within a month of one another that are basically uh, 
when you judge by the cover viewed similarly one eats into the sales of the other i yeah. guess yeah. i don't know <laughs> but um it's uh it's a peculiarity we've got to do some more digging on yeah it. <laughs> yeah but invisible orchard is a is a definitely a, a, a really good example of a concept album by your dad which is very much inspired by space yes and you can definitely also hear it in uh, in the compositions that uh it's uh uh you know uh, based on space and final frontier and the unknown out there at least that yeah. how's how that's how it comes across to me yeah. um so it, just one little bit on that yeah of course <clears throat> the original um vibraphonist Emil richards yeah yeah <clears throat> Now, fast forward in time, the Los Angeles Jazz Institute decides to perform at one of its uh, multi-day uh, um, concerts some of the tunes off of Invisible Orchard. Yeah. Who's playing vibes? Emil Richards, mm -hmm. still there, still playing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's Great. beautiful. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. That, and that's so. And that's what we definitely should also acknowledge. Uh, um, for the the last uh, for the last uh, uh, West Coast gig that we did, we were able to do a, a small tribute to uh, to Shorty and his pieces uh, with the help of uh, uh, Marshall. Um, uh, I got in touch with uh, Charles Richards uh, from uh, Charlie Richards from uh, Riverside College, and uh, he was uh, uh, so gracious in uh, giving uh, us copies of uh, Shorty's pieces, and they have about in between 35 and 50 charts uh -huh. of, your, of yeah. your father there. So, you know, that was a huge honor to perform that music and, you know, from all of those records that I totally love and that we both loved and that we got to play those. And those are not the only pieces that I have because I've got more in the meantime. Very good. <laughs> so there will be more. Um, but uh, maybe we can play something uh, from... Uh, uh, from uh, Invisible Origin yeah. because it's a very different album than what we've heard so far. Yeah, the Saturian. Saturian Sunrise.
there's stuff in there that we haven't heard throughout the other recordings that we've heard, but that he really goes mm -hmm. more out, like yeah. towards the the, the <laughs> spatial sounds yeah. or yeah. whatever you yeah. know, however you want to call he just that. Just had that that eight bars or twelve bars, whatever. He just went for it. Yeah, yeah. It yeah. just yeah. takes you on a little side trip, and <laughs> that's great. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, which shows his obvious prowess as an orchestrator and depth as an arranger it could do anything he wanted yeah. and, but all these tunes they're just they're, they're so natural I feel like they're standards you know, West Coast standards yeah. really just listening to the chord changes I'm like god classic yeah always a classic sound yeah whatever you did but how much do you, the, the, were you aware of how much time your dad spent in his studio like writing for either this because to me it sounds like he was writing all the time well, it seemed that way to me as a kid that he was in the studio a lot. <clears throat> um, you know, when he when he started, I, I, I think when he was writing um, for his own music, <clears throat> it was more an issue of uh, on his own time and just. A little more relaxed. Mm -hmm. I know when he was scoring movies, he would stress out over it. He would make a list. You know, there's what, pick a number, 15 scenes that need music. And he'd write a list of the 15 and he'd put a check mark next to each one. Mm -hmm. He was on deadline mm -hmm. and he knew that by next Wednesday he had to have it all done. So he'd apportion his time accordingly. Yeah. And we were, uh, as kids, we were told not to disturb. <laughs> so, uh, the, um, I mean, that, that converted two-car garage that was his studio was right next to the backyard swimming pool uh, at my folks' house. And I remember occasionally his musician, fellow musicians would come over and they'd listen to something. Um, and uh, we'd be swimming in the pool <laughs> and they'd come and they'd go. And my friends would say to me, gosh, you're, you know, your dad has some weird looking friends. <laughs> you know, because this was in the day when nobody had facial hair except musicians <laughs> and, and Fidel Castro. <laughs> but um, yeah, it was always, it was always kind of entertaining to, to, uh, see his friends and, right. and respect his time mm -hmm. in his studio. Speaking of one of uh, one of your father's uh, colleagues and friends, actually, uh, which you might not or might know something about their relationship, but with uh, his relationship with Bill Holman. You know, I don't know a lot about that. Um, as a as a fellow composer arranger, there. There were numerous that came out of the Kenton band. Mm -hmm. Pete Rugolo mm -hmm. is another example. Um, but I don't know a lot about Bill Holman. Um, a great player. Yeah. Um, yeah. And obviously extremely well respected. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Well, we interviewed uh, uh, Willis uh, uh, in one of our first episodes in uh, he uh, he mentioned that he has really really high regard for for your uh, for your father and I think uh, your father was uh, one of the first uh, people who basically you know gave Willis the lay of the land of how to write plus Russ Garcia yeah mm -hmm. um, so uh, Willis talks with a very high respect so I have to mention this one you know I'm always reading uh, biographies of jazz musicians mm. I find it fascinating it helps me complete the puzzle that that is my dad's career mm. um, and lo and behold a few years ago I pick up the Henry Mancini biography it's called uh, did they mention the music? Mm. Referring to jazz critics' write-ups of uh, reviews of movies. And in there, I, I think I'm recalling this correctly, there were four kingpin, kingpins in Henry's career mm. that, that he says, without these four, I wouldn't have made it as well as I did. And one of them is my dad. Wow. I just couldn't believe it. Wow. The story goes that 
um, when he was doing the music to, was it Peter Gunn? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. th this was early on, and I think there was relatively little um, releasing on an LP of al uh, 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 of music from a TV show, mm -hmm. and the the powers that be said to Henry, "Hey, we want to put out an album uh, of your." Peter Gunn music, we think it'll do pretty well. Well, Henry's reaction was, well, I'm not a band leader. I don't have a band. I'm a composer, arranger, but I need somebody to do this for me. And he called my dad and said, mm. hey, I got an idea. My music, your band. And my dad said, well, let me think about it. Mm. And let's have lunch in a week and, and we'll talk about it. When they got together for lunch, my dad, being the humble guy that he was, said, you know, it's not my music, Henry. This is a big opportunity for you. Use my band, call it your band, <laughs> cut the album. There was some, I, I don't quite fully know the story about allocation of pressings. Mm. And my dad and his record company reallocated a bunch of his uh, uh, pressings to Henry for this uh, Peter Gunn LP. Fast forward, that album, mm -hmm. I wanna say it was 1958, could have been 59, won the Grammy that year. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So missed opportunity for my dad, but <laughs> great, great boost yeah. for Henry. Yeah. Um, oh, wow. Yeah. I didn't know the story. This yeah. Great. yeah. 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 I, the the write-up in Henry's biography didn't, uh, so much talk about that as the reason that Henry uh, identified my dad as a big boost in his career. Um, uh, but it's a great, great story. Yeah. Uh, how did you find uh, out about this this piece of trivia? In in uh, I think it's mentioned elsewhere in in Henry's biography. Yeah, I'm pretty sure that's where I ran okay. across it. I didn't yeah. know that there was even a biography. Did, I did read they it. mention the music? And it's a great oh, biography. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That and Terry Gibbs' bio. Yeah. Also very good. Oh, well, he's he's always trying it. To <laughs> he's say, always plugging. Oh, he's Kevin, always have trying. My book? Have you <laughs> finally bought my autobiography, Kevin? <laughs> it's no. Big yeah, 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 yeah. And it's a, it's a book of fifty dollars, if not yeah, more. Yeah, right. It's not cheap. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's no but, excuse. We got to read it. Yeah, you know, like <laughs> on my Christmas list, you know. Yeah. Um, uh, what I, there are two things left on the yeah. uh, on the list. What do we got? List. Um, this is an actually uh, an album that your dad did not arrange, but it's under his name, uh, and it's uh, Mavis meets Shorty. Yeah, Mavis Rivers and 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 your father, um, Mavis Rivers. Uh, for those of you who don't know, was an incredible singer, um, a Samoan, uh, and uh, moved out here. And she happens to be uh, the mother of Matt Cattingoop. Composer yeah, yeah. and uh, incredible yeah, player. woodwind player, um, and I actually recently heard uh, about this uh, about this recording, and I recently listened to a few tracks, and I think that she sounds incredible. Uh, the way how the arrangements are made, they feature your dad with the melody parts, but also improvising. Um, the arranger who gets credit for it is this gentleman called Chuck Sagel. Who used to be an A and R guy at Reprise, and that's also where this label was yeah. uh, released on on yeah. Reprise. Uh, so this should be the track. I got you I've got you under my skin, which is the standard of standards. But this arrangement is just yeah, really, just, really incredible. Yeah, check it out. <laughs> skin I've got you deep in the heart of me so deep in my heart you're really a part of me I've got you under my skin I tried so not to give in I said to myself this affair never will go so well 
above Why should I try to resist when, darling, I know so well I've got you under my skin I'd sacrifice anything come what might for the sake of having you near in spite of a warning voice that comes in the night and repeats and repeats in my ear. Don't you know, little fool, you never can win. Use your mentality. Wake up to reality. But each time I do just the thought of you makes me stop before I begin. Cause I got you. Under my skin Why should I try to resist when, darling, I know oh, oh so well I've got you under my skin I'd sacrifice anything, come what might for the sake of having you near In spite of a warning voice that comes in the night and repeats in my ear Don't you know, little fool, you never can win You lose your mentality to reality but each time i do just the thought of you makes me stop before i begin because i've got you all under my skin i've got you under my skin to dig that album yeah, out and listen to it again i have the the mp3s for it uh, that's that's going to be in the package of what we have to send you oh fabulous <laughs> um we have a, a few questions actually from yeah. people who are watching okay um uh lauren kaplan is asking have you considered writing a biography about hmm. your dad <laughs> well i've had a number of people make that suggestion mm -hmm. um and it's a big undertaking. Um, I haven't ruled it out. You know, there's a guy in Valdosta, Georgia, that my dad was working with to uh, come up with a biography. And um, crazy as it sounds, um, I have never seen a copy of it. Mm. Um, I call him about once a year and ask him to... Uh, uh, you know, make a copy and send it to me and, and it just never happens. And just yesterday I was thinking I ought to just jump on a plane and fly back there and knock on his front door. <laughs> um, yeah, I don't care what shape it's in, I just want it. So that's that's probably a starting point for the whole thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. That, that would be very interesting. I think that would be a very interesting story to to read. I'm currently uh, reading the biography of Stan Levy. How is it? Good? Oh, it's, I it's, bet. It's, it's yeah. because that man has had an extraordinary life as a professional drummer, professional boxer, boxer yeah. and professional yeah. photographer too. Incredible. Yeah. I, yeah. The, the story I heard about Stan was if there was ever a dispute over uh, money owed by a club owner, they'd send Stan in oh, yeah. to ne do the negotiation. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, our, our friend Chuck Berghofer, he told us the story that they were at some bar and, you know, Stan and Chuck were playing together. And this guy gives a fit to Chuck, you know, and, you know, they're, they're getting into an argument. And Stan was a tall, tall. guy. He looked and, like a boxer. Yes, yeah. yes. He was big. And and uh, Stan just says to Chuck, like, don't worry, Chuck, I have you. I got you. I got you. <laughs> and, like, he was literally literally standing back there. And Chuck was like, oh, I'm, I'm fine. I'm safe with, you know, yeah. like a good boxer <laughs> behind me. <laughs> Wingman. Yeah. And, uh, well, uh, the... Our friend Taylor. Yeah, Taylor. Thanks for watching. As usual, great to have you here. He's asking, oh, he's got a few questions here. 
out of all the music listened to, which one was the hardest to record or finish? Oh, maybe one of the, his projects that he worked on. That yeah. Well, which was, a, did you know any difficult records that you're No, I would, I would just, I, I would guess Invisible Orchard. Mm. Um, because it took so long to yeah. be released. Oh. Yeah. Jordi Pujol released that oh. on Fresh Sounds. Oh, nice. So, maybe. Jordi, he's re released so much great stuff. Yeah. Outside of music, what was your dad's most what was your dad most fascinated with that influenced his creativity? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Hmm. It is a good question, and I would venture a guess that you know I, I mentioned earlier in our discussion that he was a lifelong boater, mm. lifelong. He, he bought a bought a boat. He and my mom bought a power boat in the early 1960s, and he had a real fascination with the ocean. Hmm. Um, I, I often wonder if that's related, you know, to the fascination with space. Mm -hmm. um, something about wide open spaces. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. But um, interesting. But that was a big influence on him. You know, it, it uh, mm. Hollywood can be uh, pretty aggravating, mm -hmm. and. Um, I know he would occasionally finish a project and go right down to his boat and untie the boat and go over to Catalina Island for a week or two weeks wow. and um, kind of become himself again. Mm -hmm. um, Some detox. So, yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. work detox. Yeah, yeah that's very interesting. Cool. Thank did, you. did Taylor have another question or were uh, those? He read the um, the Hank biography. He's oh. a big Hank. Yeah, yeah. 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 good, yeah. Taylor's good. Taylor's a student of the music and. He loves Russ Garcia, and Taylor's awesome. Uh, what was another one? No, that's good. That's okay. All of them. Yeah, and you're welcome, Lauren. Thanks for watching. He had the yeah. bi biography question for you. Yeah, yeah. thank yeah. you, Lauren. Yeah. Um, there's one more one more uh, thing that uh, that I have on the listening yeah. list, and uh, this is this might have been also a pivotal point in your dad's career, which is on uh, Mel Torme's uh, "Coming Home Baby." Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, I mean, Coming Home uh, was a hit uh, f of Michael Buble uh, in recent years, uh, but it's Mel Treme who, uh, who released that first. And it's actually a really uh, great album, Josh, because two of the tracks, Coming Home Baby actually is one of those, uh, uh, are arranged by Klaus Ogerman, mm -hmm. and the rest is arranged by your father. Um, and I actually uh, uh, picked out uh, Dad Dare, which is in a typical uh, shorty arrangement. Uh, would you happen to know anything about this album or the relationship that I you don't. had with Mel? Perhaps? I remember once with my dad going over to Mel's house. Oh, wow. Um, midday, Mel opened the door in his bathrobe and <laughs> sheet music. You know, we went in, <clears throat> some sheet music was reviewed, and that's about as much as I remember. Okay, it's a cool memory. Yeah, the, 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 <laughs> Mel Torme in a bathroom. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you, you did, it was a beautiful house up in the Hollywood Hills, and you, you got the sense that uh, it was Mel's throne. Yeah, he was king of the world. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, he sang like that too. Yeah. Oh yeah, he's a great actor too. Yeah. I love Mel Torme. Yeah, yeah. love the big fans. The, would you happen to know if your dad uh, had any favorite? I mean, you, we just listened to Mavis. Uh, you showed this mm -hmm. recording of your dad with Jerry Southern or uh, Mel Tremay. Uh, would you happen to know if he had some uh, favorite vocalists? Well, <clears throat> he may have, but um, I think he kind of kept that to himself mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, it, it was, it was a, um, mm. I, I don't, he, he never had a bad word to say about anyone. Mm. And, he was always thrilled uh, working with the people he worked with, um, so it was all good. Sounds sounds mm -hmm. like a guy we sh we would have liked <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. if we would have met him. Yeah, yeah. great guy. All right, Dat Dare. Dat Dare. From, uh, Mel Torme's "Coming Home, Baby." Daddy. Hey, Daddy. What's that there? Hey daddy, what that there? And why that under there? I know daddy, oh hey daddy, oh look it over there. Hey, where they going there? 
And what they doing there Daddy, can I have that big elephant over there Hey, who that in my chair And what she doing there You know, daddy, oh, hey, daddy, can I go over there Hey, daddy, what's a square And where do we get it And daddy, can I have that big elephant over there My quiz a good kid, man, he doesn't want anything hit. He's forever demanding to know who and why and what and where. Inquisitive child, and sometimes the questions are wild. Like, Daddy, can I have that big elephant over there? Don't want to cool my hair. Where my teddy bear? Daddy, look at that cowboy coming there. Hey, can I have a pair of boots like that to wear? Daddy, can I have that big elephant over there? The time will march, the years will go, the little fella's gonna grow. I gotta tell him what he needs to know. As life's parade goes trudging by, he'll need to know some reasons why. I don't have all the answers, but I'll try. Musical kid, man, he doesn't want anything hit. Inquisitive child, and sometimes the questions are why. Hey, daddy, what that there? And why that under there? And oh, daddy, oh, hey, daddy, oh, look it over there. Hey, where they going there? And what they doing there? And daddy, can I have that big elephant over there? And daddy, can I have that big elephant over there? And daddy, oh daddy, oh daddy, oh daddy, oh daddy, oh daddy, what daddy? I have this arrangement. Do you? You mm -hmm. do? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh -oh. um, there's a, a really great uh, singer in Austin, Texas, a young singer, Christian Wiggs is his name. And uh, he wanted to do this arrangement. So one of his uh, me members of his big band, uh, he does a fabulous thing out there in Austin where he has a series and uh, he's connected with the uh, business life uh, in in Austin, so there's funding also for nice. these bands. Yeah, and it's uh, Professor John Mills, who I think teaches at uh, uh, University of Texas in Austin. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. He transcribed that arrangement. Very cool. And uh, oh. we uh, the only the only the, o the only enough. thing that we just need to do is you know get an opportunity to play it. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. But. Uh, those were all of my uh, all of my picks. Yeah, well, we can go <laughs> very well two done. Hours Thank here. you. Is that right? <laughs> yeah, it's five. Yeah. Well, time all right. flies when you're having fun. That's yeah. right. it was fun. Yeah. Yeah. Very yeah. Much Thank you so. for sharing your time and your stories. Oh, absolutely. Just, just wonderful to spend some time with you discussing your father's I've legacy. I enjoyed it very much. Yeah. yeah. Us too. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, that's uh, a perfect way uh, to uh, uh, wrap things up. Um, we want to thank all of our uh, viewers and uh, all of the people who came to our concerts for this past year because this is the final show of 2022. We will be back in uh, January 2023 and we'll have our first big band concert again in April at Vibrato. Mm -hmm. uh, but for now, uh, on behalf of uh, Josh Nelson and myself and our special guest Marshall Rogers, thank, thank you, you for thank all you. the stories. Thank you. Uh, we want to wish everybody also uh, uh, happy holidays, Merry Christmas, and a happy 2023, and we'll see you all in the new year. Yeah, thanks everybody. Have a great night. Stay safe. <laughs>